my um, distinct honor to introduce our keynote for today, Sam Jaffe of the Caterpillar Lab. I'm sure he's familiar to some of you, um, but for those of you who might not know him yet, Sam is a New England-based naturalist, photographer, and educator who's been working with native insects since a very early age. He grew up in eastern Massachusetts, chasing birds, mucking through ponds, and turning over leaves. For the last 10 years, he's been photographing and filming caterpillars and organizing educational programs to share these special creatures with the public. In 2013, he founded the Caterpillar Lab, a nonprofit education organization based in Marlboro, New Hampshire, just down the road. In his work with the Caterpillar Lab, Sam travels the country bringing caterpillar education and caterpillars to museums, nature centers, schools, and individual teachers with the goal of helping native insects find a place in our everyday lives. And he brought some of them today that you can um, meet after this talk uh, downstairs. So with that, um, thank you all and welcome Sam. Uh, thanks, Brett, and to everybody uh, who sort of was part of setting this up today. Just thanks, and thanks for having me and basically letting me talk to you all about caterpillars for 40 minutes before everything else. Um, it's a pleasure to sort of give a talk locally. Uh, I've been giving some talks to groups through Zoom all over the country, um, but here I see people who have actually come into the Caterpillar Lab before, who I've seen at farmer's market shows. Um, people from Antioch, where I went to school for a master's degree, um, and also just from out and around. I actually see a lot of people who might recognize me only from the airport just nearby as that sort of weird guy in the brush looking for things. Um, so <laughs> I actually thought that's, that's how I would start today because normally at 9 a.m. I'm not giving a talk. I'm actually out there um, in the landscape. This is a little scene from the airport. Um, is it working? There we go, yeah. Um, I go here almost every morning. I get to use the excuse that I need to get host plants for the caterpillars, so I go out and I collect oak and cherry and birch and all the things they need to eat. But really, I get to either you know sit on the side of the road and watch the birds fly by or just try to make little discoveries. Um, this is basically my patch. I don't know if anybody out there recognizes that term, but it's a little part of the landscape where I go all the time, I get to know the seasons, all the creatures in it, and uh, sort of have more familiarity with it than anywhere else. Um, so yesterday morning, I went down there and I saw some things. There was a northern shrike in one of the dead red maple trees. Um, a woolly bear crossed the road, so they're still active. I searched on some sand piles and found little um, wild indigo dusky wing skippers um, eating some of the vetch there. Um, and I looked on spirea bushes along the edge of the road and I found a, a little cluster of um, New England buck moth eggs. So there's, there's a lot going on there and I collect these, these images, these memories, these moments all the time. And I think, um, you know, we all, we all do as, as bird watchers or herpers um, or botanists, we go out and we see these things and we add them to our list of little secrets. Um, but what I want to talk about mostly this morning is all the stuff that's happening behind the scenes that sort of gives all of our little finds, all of these moments, um, a lot of meaning. Everything working okay? Okay. <laughs> so that woolly bear that I saw crossing the road, that was a, a fun moment to see, no problem. Um, but where did it come from? You know, where was it going? What's it going to do across the time of its life? How is it going to get through the winter? And especially, you know, what are all the different things it's going to interact with? Um, is it going to be food for something? Is it going to pollinate something one day? What is the real whole story behind that creature? Um, the eggs I found. Um, is this going okay? Good. Sorry, I'm still getting used to the technology here. <laughs> So the eggs I found of the New England buck moth, you know, are those going to succeed and be caterpillars next year and become moths? Or again, are they going to be food for something else? What is the whole story behind them? Um, investigating nature in this way has been really powerful. Um, and through my work at the Caterpillar Lab, we have really found that digging deep into the behind the scenes stories of all of the creatures we work with gives them relevance, meaning, and shows their value in a way that uh, goes beyond just sort of enjoying them as, as individuals and moments in time. 
So this is just a quick slideshow um, of some of the Caterpillar Lab events starting way back in 2009 here, where we, we show these, these creatures that I've become so familiar with that we find around in the landscape. Uh, we get to enjoy them as just big charismatic critters. Um, certainly they delight a lot of audiences, but we also get to dig in deeper. We use things like microscopes to watch them transform. We can see them shed their skin or pupate. Um, we see them eating and pooping plenty. Um, and we also catch moments like parasitoid wasps bursting out of caterpillars, um, sort of shocking things that really go towards this idea that these creatures are not isolated, they're not alone, they're part of these big whole stories. Um, so it's become my passion as a naturalist to just try to uncover these things, to spend enough time outside and enough time watching and rearing these animals to witness those moments that give them relevance and value. Um, but also now through the Caterpillar Lab as an educator to bring these stories to people. And we found some crazy ways to do it. That was a picture of a, the inside of a caterpillar. You know, we have transparent caterpillars. We can see through their bodies. We can watch things like those parasitic wasps swimming around inside of them, learn about those connections. That's a slug caterpillar where you can see its anatomy again. Um, and in the end, though, this is what it's, it's mostly about. <laughs> Yeah, um, her mother was terrified of caterpillars, but just, she loved them, so that was fine. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a few sort of whole stories about these creatures. We're going to learn their, their relevance and, and see how big we can make a little caterpillar. Um, to start off, I want to tell one of these stories about a creature that's very um, personal to me. It sort of relates to, to my whole story as a naturalist, and that's the black swallowtail caterpillar here. So when I was maybe four years old, my parents would find caterpillars crawling around inside the house, like in the kitchen, in the living room. They tell the story a lot. Um, and they had no idea where they were coming from until eventually they realized their toddler was just sort of hijacking caterpillars from the backyard and moving them around. Um, so it wasn't uh, too much of a reach when, when we decided to do some rearing. Um, my first memory of rearing caterpillars is the black swallowtail. My mom had gone onto the backyard collected some parsley for dinner, was about to throw it all in the cuisine art, and at the last moment realized there were three big, plump black swallowtail caterpillars on it. So they didn't become dinner, they became my first experience. Um, my mother is an architect, an artist. She helped me watch these creatures. We sketched them, we observed. My father is a theoretical physicist, um, so a scientist, and we set up little experiments. When the caterpillars got close to becoming pupa, or chrysalis, uh, we actually hung different colored crayons in the enclosure, and the caterpillars became pupa on those crayons. We sort of made them do that a little bit. Um, and their pupa, again, pupa the chrysalis here, um, they ended up matching the colors of the crayons in different tones of green and brown. So we did this little experiment that's always stuck with me, uh, showing that these creatures can react to their environment and change with it. Um, but the big moment really came at the end of this. My father, the theoretical physicist, supposed to know the way the universe works, uh, he told me we were gonna get these beautiful butterflies and I'd come down every morning and look at the chrysalis and hope to see that moment when the butterflies emerged. And it hasn't happened since that time, but I came down one morning, a chrysalis was twitching a little bit, and I watched, not as a butterfly came out, but as a trogus wasp, a native specialized wasp that only uses these swallowtails, bit its way out the side of the pupa, emerged and started to dry its glittering blue wings. So usually I'm looking around to see if there's like some face that says this is horrifying or how unfortunate for that poor child. <laughs> but I thought this was great. Um, you know, I, I sometimes like to say this is when I realized that nature could provide endless experiences and you never knew what was gonna happen and discovery was everywhere. Um, but I think this stuck with me more just because this was the first time I knew my father to be wrong about something. Um, <laughs> and when your father's a theoretical physicist, it's, it's nice to have that power. And um, just to speak to, to natural history study for a minute, I mean, I think this is really important. When you go outside and you find things and you watch them, you can make discoveries on your own. You can be your own teacher. You can make your own discoveries. You don't need somebody there necessarily to tell you what's happening. Um, for kids especially, I mean, how powerful is that to be able to go out and find something and see something and then teach your, your scientist father about it? Um, so this was a very memorable and important moment for me. But 
that experience with that one caterpillar, the black swallowtail and the trogus wasp, you know, powerful as it was, that's one species in one moment. We have between 3,000 and 5,000 species of caterpillar here in New England. Um, each one of those caterpillars comes with its story as a caterpillar, as a pupa, as an adult, different ways that it'll interact with the environment. Um, each one of them comes with a set of parasitoid wasps and flies, some of them generalized, but many of them specialists on just those caterpillars. So each one comes with that whole story. And I'm gonna focus on the caterpillars today, those 3,000 to 5,000 species. We won't cover them all, I, I promise. <laughs> um, but out there, I mean, if you're thinking about my talk here, think about it in terms of the birds or the reptiles or the plants or the mushrooms. All of those organisms, those individuals, have these huge wells of background stories to them that, that add to them. Um, usually I get to talk a bit about each one of these caterpillars. We don't have the time for it today, but just to say these are all caterpillars that live around here. Um, just a small selection of charismatic ones like the decorator that wears petals on its back, the twig mimics which are outside right now um, all winter long, freezing and thawing. Um, and this little guy here, this is a Tecmesa, the black edged prominent that has inflatable tails and whips them out whenever it gets scared and sort of throws them over its back and gnashes its jaws. So there's a lot of different creatures out there um, to find. And I can say pretty much every caterpillar that's going by here I've seen at the airport at various times. The monkey slug caterpillar, all right. <laughs> um, now we're gonna dig into a few species and this is one I really like to focus on because it's not universally loved. Um, anybody know what this one is by chance? What do you think? <laughs> Tomato worm. Yeah, so this is the, the tobacco hornworm, like the tomato worm. So this is a species that you find on your tomato plants, your peppers, your tobacco. I'm not sure too many people here are growing tobacco in their yards, but um, <laughs> the tomato hornworm is actually a different species that used to live in New England, um, but we think it's extirpated or went extinct here about 40 years ago as a breeding species. So we really see this uh, Carolina sphinx or tobacco hornworm mostly. So when we bring this to a program, farmer's market program, we'll put it on some tomatoes or peppers and it'll be totally devouring them, these huge caterpillars. And we, we love it, but the farmer next door might have something to say about it. Um, but really, this, this is a native creature. It's charismatic. Um, it's, it's a great find. I go to, um, let's see, Tracy's Community Farm every year. Uh, go into their hoop houses and find hundreds of these things, massive hornworms. I just love it. Um, they're great at growing these there. <laughs> but when we look at this creature in isolation in your backyard eating your tomatoes, you might think of it as a, a pest or a bad guy. But when you zoom back and you look at the whole story, we look at the whole um, life cycle, how it changes through time and all the creatures it interacts with, we're gonna see it as something else. We're gonna see it as a real beneficial organism. So they eat plants in the Solanaceae family, um, and I like to think they're sort of like horticulturalists. They have shaped these plants. They've been eating them for a very long time. So the chemistry in these plants, um, the flavors in the fruits we eat from them, um, the shape of the leaves, everything about them has been changed because of their interactions with the Manduca hornworms like this one. Um, in fact, a lot of food is like this. If you eat a brassica plant and you've got that sort of bitter taste we have in a lot of the brassicas, those are defensive anti-herbivory chemicals that evolved in reactions to things like caterpillars, in that case, the uh, cabbage white butterfly eating them. So the interactions between plants and their herbivorous caterpillars have shaped those plants and made them interesting to us and made them diverse in the natural world. So these little creatures eating the leaves are horticulturalists. They've also um, been affected by the plants. So the plant develops an anti-herbivory toxin like nicotine, and the caterpillar eventually overcomes that, and now the hornworms use nicotine as a defense. So they can actually store nicotine gas um, near their breathing holes, and they'll burp on predators when they're attacked. There's a, a great paper to look up. It's toxic halitosis by the tobacco hornworm. Um, there's other sides to this creature, though, than just eating and evolving with its host plants. They're eaten by a lot of things, and we often hear about birds eating caterpillars. Um, very important for birds. Birds eat a lot of caterpillars. They feed them to their young. Without caterpillars, external living larvae out there, uh, we'd have a lot fewer birds. They wouldn't have the resources they need. 
Um, but birds aren't a great balance for caterpillars. They don't eat enough caterpillars and they don't eat them in a specialized enough way to help balance their numbers in the environment. It's really the parasitoid wasps and flies that help us there, help the world there. So the bottom left here, we've got a braconid wasp that lays eggs just in tobacco hornworms and tomato hornworms. The eggs hatch inside the caterpillar. They live as a parasite. Um, the larvae live as a parasite and eventually grow up and come out of the caterpillar and spin those incredible little cocoons all over them. So if we have gardeners here, you might recognize those cocoons. Um, in the bottom right is another step in this process. That's a hyperparasitoid calcid wasp. That's the wasp that lays eggs into the wasps that laid eggs into the caterpillar. So we've got a little video for a different species of sphinx called a fawn sphinx um, showing this process. And it's something that we really do like to, to bring to audiences whenever possible. It, this is the best sort of in your face example of what ecology is all about. You know, things, using things, using other things all the time, repeated in the natural world that we can put in front of people. Um, also, it, it really does draw people in, maybe a little bit like a, a train wreck, but it still grabs attention. So these are the braconid wasps emerging from the caterpillar. At this stage, when we're showing it at a program, live under the microscopes, we have a lot of people who look like they'd, they'd rather not be there. Um, but we're talking about how important it is that these relationships exist, that this is part of the whole story of all of these caterpillars, that they're consumed in specialized ways. But pretty quickly after they emerge, these little guys, these larval braconid wasps, start to spin cocoons. And they do it in a beautiful and delicate way. They spin one little loop of silk at a time. So we'll see that in just a moment. And this is when people's attitudes change a little bit. I mean, not only is it, is it weirdly beautiful to watch these little creatures so busy at work to create these cocoons, but they're doing it because they need to defend themselves from their own set of predators. So they're spinning these cocoons because as soon as the braconids emerge from our caterpillar, they're now susceptible to their own set of predators and parasitoids, the hyperparasitoids. Um, this video is a real surprise. I had this set up inside the Caterpillar Lab on a little white stage. Looks like a sterile environment back there. I'm filming them all spinning these cocoons, and in the middle of filming, another wasp just showed up out of the Caterpillar Lab and started laying her eggs into these wasps. Sort of crazy to think that we have an entire ecological world going on inside the lab. It's not really supposed to be that way. But uh, <laughs> so this is the chalcid wasp who comes along and lays her eggs into the other wasps. So through years of doing this, especially using the microscopes at programs and taking this close of a look, we realized this is not exceptional at all. This is just normal life out there in the insect world, that we have a wasp that uses a wasp that uses a caterpillar that eats a plant and that all those interactions are specialized, that's sort of more of a rule than an exception. So if you have a tobacco hornworm in your backyard, you're going to occasionally have the braconid wasps using it. And if you see those little white cocoons on the back of your hornworm, we've now documented four different species of hyperparasitoid coming out of them. And this, again, backyard, um, down the street, Tracy's Community Farm, <laughs> all those places has this going on. Of course, that's just the caterpillar, right? So a lot of the caterpillars, a lot of the hornworms are being consumed in various creative ways, but a few of them make it, a few of them leave their plants, they go underground, um, they become a pupa, and eventually the next year they become an adult moth. And this is another place we can find value in our hornworms. Um, not only are they horticulturalists shaping the plants they eat, not only are they prey for many, many things, providing um, resources, moving energy around the environment, but also one day they become a very unique and specialized pollinator. So the adult moth here has the longest tongue of any pollinator in New England, and they actually pollinate a lot of the plants that they eat as caterpillars. So they love datura and tobacco, and in this way I think of these hornworms a bit like farmers, like us, you know, they're they're going out there and they're moving their host plant around, helping it grow and then devouring it. Just to finish this up, I just wanted to think about a single hornworm egg here. So this is the egg of a tobacco hornworm taken from my yard many years ago. And we brought it to a program and we watched as three different egg parasitoid wasps of two species developed within the egg, within this single egg. So there's two small trichogramma wasps, the little yellow guys, and one big, um, 
wasp there who's gonna eat its way out and they'll all sort of escape with it. So you have a moth lay an egg and it could become food and a resource for specialist egg parasitoid wasps. Or maybe if it's lucky, it hatches. And then that little caterpillar starts to grow and that could become food for a number of other things, whether it's feeding baby birds or specialist wasps and flies. And maybe if it's lucky, it'll grow up and be that pollinator. But there's so many different options for every little hornworm egg and every little insect egg that's laid out there. All right, this is my chance to sort of sing the praise of the caterpillar of the herbivore here. So we're gonna zoom in just for a moment on this interaction. You know, we had the hornworm eating the leaf. This is a lithophany or a pinion caterpillar eating red maple flowers in spring. We have demonized this interaction as a society. Maybe it's because we were all, you know, we come from this sort of agrarian farmer history that the idea of a caterpillar or an insect eating a leaf is this horrible thing. We have permits for hundreds of species at the Caterpillar Lab to bring them across state lines to do shows. And every single permit we have, it doesn't matter how rare the caterpillar is, is listed as a, as a pest permit, as a, an herbivore pest permit. Um, but this interaction here, this is one of the most tremendous ecological services there are. We, we talk about ecological services like pollination a lot, how important that is, predation, uh, foxes eating rabbits, you know, helping balance the ecosystem. But right here, we've got an example of something that we can't live without. This caterpillar is eating red maple flowers. There's plenty of caterpillars out there eating oak leaves and maple leaves and cherry leaves. They're eating all kinds of things that we can't eat, that most organisms can't eat, that most organisms can't make energy from. Caterpillars eat more leaves and more green material than all the other herbivores in New England forests combined. They are our major herbivore. If you had all the leaves they eat on one side of a stadium and all the leaves that everything else ate on the other, the caterpillar pile would dwarf the other pile. And what that really means, when you look at the whole story, how these caterpillars are used and sort of give back throughout their lives, is that they are transmitting, transferring more energy in the environment than any other group here. They are moving more leaf energy to make it accessible to the rest of the ecological world than anything else. So we really like to celebrate this. And again, when you look at the whole story, herbivory can change meaning. Here are the Eastern tent caterpillars, one of my favorites. I seem to like all the ones nobody else likes very much, but um, these might devour your cherry tree in your backyard. That's not good for your cherry tree. But when you consider all of the things that are using them, the specialized yellow-billed cuckoo that just loves to eat these guys and can do it like nobody else, the hundreds of species of parasitoid wasp that use them, then that interaction right there doesn't become devastating, it becomes beautiful. That is sustaining the world. That's turning cherry leaves into resources for everything. And these interactions are going on at every scale. Um, this little creature here is a leaf miner. There are probably more caterpillars that live inside of leaves and stems and roots than live outside. They're really tiny little things. We can, at a program, watch them eat individual cells. If you'd like to join me at the tables later, we can watch some of these. We got some at the airport earlier today um, in the rain. That was fun. <laughs> um, but they're in there turning leaf material into other resources. And where there is a resource in nature, it's going to be used. If we have healthy ecosystems, we, nothing goes to waste. It's hard to imagine that a caterpillar of this scale eating cells is used by much. Certainly birds aren't often picking them out of leaves. But when we raise these at the Caterpillar Lab, most of the time we don't get moths from them. Most of the time we get wasps again. There are parasitoid wasps that know just how to find this caterpillar in its leaf, lay an egg through the leaf surface into the caterpillar and grow up inside. All right, let me just do a quick time check to see where we're at. Good. Actually, this was an interesting one. We was doing this time lapse overnight a few years ago and came in and the caterpillar was gone. Um, overnight, it decided it was time to become a pupa, so it, it opened up its little leaf here and catapulted out, and it took me a good half an hour of looking through the carpet at the lab at the time to find it, um, but yeah, here it goes. We um, show these a lot at programs. We bring them to schools. They're one of the resources, one of the caterpillars that's really available to everybody. So if you're in downtown New York and there's street trees, <laughs> you can find these leaf miners. Um, if, uh, if we do a program at a school and we want to make sure the kids can actually go out in the schoolyard and find creatures, you know, leaf miners are, are where it's at. Unfortunately, sometimes they bring them all inside and we've had emails from teachers like, we have 200 leaves with caterpillars in them and what do we do now? And I can't really help them that much in that case. 
um, for a sort of real, uh, let's see, curveball here. We're going to leave behind that standard interaction of caterpillar eating leaf and getting eaten and look at some other types of interactions involved in the whole story. And to do that, we're going we're to start with something that's, that's not a caterpillar. Um, these are acorn ants. There's three species of acorn ants that live here um, in this immediate area. Um, I find at least two of them at the airport. You go and find last year's acorns with a little hole in it, and you can find these colonies. Um, this is the beginning of a train of interactions that'll lead us to some very unique caterpillars. So to get these acorn ants, um, already a lot had to come into play. We needed an oak tree to produce acorns. That involves many, many years of growths and appropriate habitat, pollination. You get your acorn, and then a solid acorn isn't appropriate for these ants. They need more to sort of come into play. First, we need a beetle, a caterpillar. There's various things that will actually eat the inside of an acorn. Uh, my favorite's the acorn weevil. They have this very long nose. They cut a hole into an acorn. They lay their egg inside. The grub eats the inside of the acorn and then pops out. They're basically making perfect ant condos all over the forest floor. Um, so these ants move in, and once you get ants in an area, everything changes. These are little keystone organisms in the forest floor. They're moving resources around as they scavenge. They're preying on different animals. And they're actually allowing certain animals to live that couldn't have existed before. So ants um, have developed some pretty strange relationships with other insects, um, often mutualisms. I've actually got an example right here, so let me just hold this up. This is the uh, woolly alder aphid. So we find these at the airport, on the roadsides, anywhere we've got alders. And for a colony of these fluffy insects to survive, they require ants. If there's no ants tending them, uh, they actually give a little sugar water. The ants come up and they drink the sugar and they protect the aphids as a food resource. If there's no ants tending them, even slugs and snails come up and just devour these things. So they don't last very long. But once you have the ants and everything they need, and once you have alder trees and everything the alders need, you can get these colonies of aphids. So it's only after all of those ingredients come together, and I'll probably make a mess of the podium here, but <laughs> that you get our caterpillar. So hidden amongst those aphids is a harvester butterfly caterpillar. It's the only predatory butterfly caterpillar in North America. It's quite common around here, um, but it needs all of these things to come together for it to be there. Right, so we needed the ants, and ant colonies of all different sorts have a lot of prerequisites, a lot of things they need. Um, we needed the alders to support these aphids. We needed all those ingredients, and finally, we get this caterpillar um, with its host right here. This is like right before a rather graphic scene. Uh, <laughs> and Looking back at the whole story, realizing how much is involved, um, it really changes the way that I look at a caterpillar or a butterfly when I see it. So you could go down on a walk in the woods and you might be lucky enough to see a harvester butterfly like this one. Um, but seeing that harvester butterfly in the moment, it's, it's beautiful, you can watch its behaviors, but it's a bit like looking like an acorn, looking at an acorn. So the acorn's an interesting thing. We already saw it has some bizarre stories connected with ants, but you have to acknowledge to get the full story of the acorn what's above it, right? So you look up from the acorn and you have the oak tree. You have the superorganism. You've got the trunk and the bark, the beetles boring through the bark. You've got the branches and the leaves. You've got leaf mining caterpillars, gall makers. You've got the parasitoids of the caterpillars and the gall makers. You've got birds eating those caterpillars. You've got this incredible branching whole story that just adds so much to the meaning of that acorn. And although the oak tree might be the, the super example of this, you know, the most connections in our forest, everything out there is like this. That shrike that I saw at the airport, it has all these connections. It had a past, it has a future, it's got all the interactions um, that add to it. And we can't just see those in a moment, but just knowing they're there is powerful. And when we educate at the Caterpillar Lab, we really want people to come away with this new perspective. We want them to look at a tree or a butterfly or, geez, an ant on the sidewalk and be blown away just by the magnitude of what that represents. Um, and we feel like that's really powerful in, in helping people change their perceptions too. It adds value to everything. A tuft of grass behind a CVS in a parking lot can mean a lot. It, it can be something you study for your whole life, but we really have to reveal that to people. 
So this, I think, might be a, a good sort of wrap up last story to put this to use here. So we've been talking about all these connections, these connections, this biodiversity of, of interactions between species, that's what really sustains the natural world. It balances everything out. It makes the world a little bit more predictable. It's one of the reasons there's usually leaves on the trees in spring and caterpillars on those leaves and enough caterpillars to feed the birds because so many creatures are interacting, using each other, taking and giving. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's why it works out there. It's a real strength of the natural world. Um, this is a great example. We've got this incredible caterpillar. It's called the waved sphinx. And it hosts a parasitic fly called Belvosia borealis. This is a big, beautiful, iridescent fly. Um, it lays its eggs near the feeding caterpillar. And the caterpillar eats the egg, and then the caterpillar is eaten from the inside out by, by this fly. But the fly goes off, and it's a pollinator. And it's actually a, a pretty specialized and devoted pollinator for umbiliferous or APACA family plants. So you'll see these all over wild cow parsnip, for instance. So to get this pollinator, we needed this caterpillar. And those are you know, part of the interactions that sustain, but it's also a reason, well, as much of it as it's a strength, it's also a bit of a weakness when you introduce rapid change. So you've got human beings out there changing the world, introducing non-native species, causing climate change, changing habitats. And those changes break down these interactions. Um, in this case, this wave sphinx is a specialist itself. It only eats ash trees. So many of you might have heard of the emerald ash borer. It's sweeping across North America. It's in our neighborhoods now, ash is disappearing. Because of the whole story idea, because of all these connections, when we lose something like an ash tree, we're not just losing this one tree in the forest. We're losing countless specialized caterpillars that use it. We're not just losing those caterpillars. We're using all the things that eat them, use them, specialize on them. We're losing Belvosia borealis, the pollinator of one of our plants. So the cascade of effects when something goes wrong is dramatic. And that's something else we really want people to understand. You know, when we're talking about an endangered species, when we're talking about something that was extirpated from New England or an invasive species coming in and causing harm, we're talking about something that's disrupting whole sectors of the natural world. So I don't have great answers as far as like, how do we fix the potential problem of disrupting these, this biodiversity? Um, but I, I have my own sort of ideas of, of how we can make a difference. I certainly, the first one here is my uh, rallying cry. It's what I do for a living. I think most people out there don't know, don't internalize the full scope of what's happening in the natural world. They don't look at a butterfly and realize how much it depends on and how much depend on it. So I really think education is, is a first step here. People have to know what's out there to want to conserve it and too many people don't. Uh, natural history is like a best kept secret, except to the people in this room, right? Um, so this is where I urge everyone to try and be a little bit of a naturalist extrovert going forward. I'm actually not like the most effusive social person in the world, but when it comes to talking about caterpillars, <laughs> the things that I love, I mean, not only does it, it bring out my excitement, but I know how valuable it is to try and get other people engaged in this. So if you have an opportunity to provide an experience or a moment for someone else that will welcome them into the fold, I think it's really important to take it. Um, just to drive this home, I'm sure you can all think of a moment in your past when something happened, something you saw or some moment, somebody pointed out a, a warbler to you that, that changed the course of your involvement in this field. We can provide more and more of those intentionally, those moments. Um, I also think we really do want to focus on biodiversity. You know, we, the two wrapped up in things like good guys and bad guys, pollinators versus herbivores, um, as long as we're talking about native species interacting the way they have been for a very long time, these creatures all need to be celebrated, protected, considered. So that's that all hail the herbivore moment in my talk. Uh, pollination is amazing, it's great, but let's talk about it all. Let's make sure people understand that the caterpillar eating their rose is actually just as vital as the bee. Um, and finally, I do think a lot of us have spaces that we have some control over. Whether that's um, you know, your backyard, or a town that you're engaged in, or for me, maybe it's, it's talking to the uh, airport land managers, but we can make difference across the countryside. We can plant native plants, we can use our spaces to educate, put some signage up, or make a, a nice little prairie in our front yards. 
um, or we can try to protect and conserve and, and urge um, land managers in the right direction. So all of those things can make a difference. For me, though, that first one always comes through. If I can create a whole fleet of little naturalists going forward, I think I'm, I'm doing the best job I can do. Can I do a time check? If you... we've, we've got five minutes. They have little sheets for me because I'm known for going on for like hours and hours. So. Um, so I'm going to leave this screen up for a second, which just has my information, but then I'm going to end with just one really extra cool caterpillar story, because I can't resist. Um, in the background, scrolling, you can't see it that well on the screen, is, is just uh, innumerable native caterpillars that we work with at the lab. Um, you can all visit the lab. Right now we're open Saturdays 12 to 5, and we have our tables there. We've got microscopes set up. We talk about all these stories, and I just love hearing about what people are finding and, and trying to investigate the whole stories with them. Um, and to end on a, a strange note, I'm just going to talk about one more weird ant-caterpillar interaction, and it does show how our understanding of the whole story changes over time. So this is actually from the airport. I've also seen these at the Harris Center. It's a silvery blue caterpillar, and it's got a tending ant on it. So we already saw a caterpillar that eats aphids that get protected by ants. These caterpillars actually directly feed ants, so they feed ants sugar water. Um, they sing to the ants. The ants find them. They feed them the sugar water. The ants love it. They want more of it, so they protect the caterpillars from predators so they can get more. And this is the interaction going on here. So it's got its ants, it's feeding them, the ants are caring for the caterpillar, they're constantly tickling it, asking for more food. <laughs> and for a very long time, this was thought to be a, a beautiful little mutualism that we could celebrate and feel good about. Um, it turns out something a little bit creepy is going on, though. Um, when scientists started looking at ant brains, they found that after the ants feed on the sugar water from the caterpillar, all the dopamine in the ants' brains is gone. So there's something hidden in the sugar water that makes the ants depressed. It takes away this chemical that makes them happy. And then they have little inflatable tentacles that come out of their rear end that look like little sea anemones. Here they come. Let's see if we can see them. Boop. <laughs> and once the ants have drunk the sugar water, lost their dopamine, they become very excited by those tentacles. And the idea is that the, the caterpillars have taken something away from the ants, and now they're giving something back that makes them feel good, but isn't really that good for the ants. Um, the caterpillars are able to stop feeding the ants sugar water, and they start just inflating those tentacles. And the ants become so devoted that they'll fight to the death to save their caterpillars. And the, even after the caterpillar's done, if pupated or gets eaten, a lot of these ants just sort of settle down, lie down, and, and end up dying. Um, that's a happy story to end things on. But <laughs> The point is, as we look deeper and deeper, we get more and more meaning. Some things we thought were true at first, we get these little curveballs. We learn a lot from this. I've learned just how close parasitism is to mutualism. I never, I always thought of those as opposites, not neighbors. Um, but I really, I just want to encourage all of you out there to take whatever topic you're interested in, whatever creature you're out there looking for, and just choose one of them or a whole suite of them and try to dig down a little bit deeper and find the whole story uh, examine it, find that value, because it really changes a lot about the way you see the world. So, thanks uh, very much, for everybody. <laughs>